Bismillah, alhamdulillah, subhanahu wa rasulillah, wa alayhi wa sallam. I just wanted to, on behalf of the whole community, uh, welcome again our sister Noor Buddha, who's uh, um, farther away now than she was from this community. <laughs> She's from uh, Bronx, New York, and they live in the D.C. area now. Hopefully they'll move back up north, inshallah. I'll leave it to all you women. You guys know how to do that stuff. Uh, encourage her to come back our way, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah make her a benefit. And inshallah, the lecture will go for roughly about 45 minutes, maybe, or so. If that, then it'll be another 45 minutes to have open discussion when the live stream will be off and you can be at your uh, full comfort. And also, after Salat al Maghrib, you know there's a fiqh fasting downstairs, but please feel free to come back upstairs uh, and continue um, consulting, bonding, uh, getting to know our sister Noor. Don't feel like you're going to offend me or anybody else by doing that. Take advantage of it here a lot more. All right? Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum, sisters Can everybody hear me in the back? Louder? Should I be much louder? Do we want to close the door? Is that more comfortable? I'm sorry that we're starting a little bit um, late. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, I see some familiar faces from NJ Dawa. Um, it's very nice to be back here. Uh, before we get started, I like to sometimes just get to know the audience that I'm speaking to. So just to get an idea, how many of you have children? MashaAllah. How many of you are teenagers? <coughs> <laughs> the mom. And how many of you are in your 20s? MashaAllah. Okay. Um, how many of you were born here in the United States and you grew up here? Okay, how many of you immigrated here later in life? Okay, wonderful, mashallah. Okay, so this is a topic that um, it's very big, it's very broad. I'm oftentimes asked to discuss my experience as a Muslim born uh, woman and then leaving Islam and then coming back to Islam, but there's so much that I can say about it. It really depends on the audience that's here. And mashallah, this is a very diverse audience, so I'm gonna do my very best to um, discuss aspects of my experience that will resonate with those of you who are moms, who also did not grow up in the United States, as well as those of you who are born here and who are growing up here and who also have kind of a dual identity as Muslims and as Americans. So I'll do my best, but if there's something that I don't cover, please feel free to ask during the Q&A section. Um, so this is the question <laughs> that I get the most frequent um, on my social media, and I guess it's because so many Muslims today are struggling with their uh, faith and being uh, connected to Islam. And unfortunately, it is the reality for many of us, especially those of us who were born here and who are growing up here, our parents, like many of the mothers sitting here, did not have to necessarily battle the same battles that Muslims in America today are going through. Um, a little bit of background about me before we get started. Um, I was born in 1986 in Damascus, Syria. My mother's side is from Syria. My father's side is from Palestine. Um, my parents moved to New York before I was even one year old. So even though I was born in Syria, sometimes I feel weird telling people I was born there because I didn't grow up there. Um, and like the Sheikh mentioned, I grew up in the Bronx in New York. I have two younger sisters, alhamdulillah. One of them is one year and a half younger. The other is five years younger and we're very close. And growing up um, in this family, in this Arab American family, for me, for the most part, as a young child, was very cultural, more cultural than it was religious. My mother prayed, we fasted during Ramadan, my father didn't really pray. Um, there was a lot of aspects of the things that I was taught that had to do more with um, adat and taqalid and um, norms and mores in our culture. Um, and growing up, I didn't know what was the difference between what is Islamic and what was coming from my Arabic background, my Arab culture. But I did grow up feeling proud to be Arab American. Um, I can't say that I also grew up feeling proud to be Muslim, especially after 9-11, um, but I will get into that a little bit more. 
there was a lot of love growing up in my household. My parents were amazing parents. They loved us all very much and they did the best they could. We grew up in a low income family. We attended public schools, my sisters and I. But like every family, we had our problems. And growing up, my sisters and I watched my parents argue a lot and fight a lot about a lot of different things. Um, and I also saw a lot of my aunts and uncles doing the same thing. So for me, it was like normal, like this is just, this is marriage. You know, the, the husband is always yelling at the wife and the wife is always, you know, submissive and that's just marriage, that's what it is. Um, so I had a very incomplete vision and view of what a healthy marriage is. Um, I knew my parents loved each other, but I couldn't understand why they were always arguing. And a very well-known psychologist, psychologist by the name of Gabor Mate says that anything that is wrong with you began as a survival mechanism in childhood. So I want you to remember this because I'm gonna come back to it and connect it to why I left Islam in the first place. <clears throat> by the time I was in maybe second or third grade, my mom realized where we were growing up in the Bronx was not the ideal community for us because there weren't very many Muslims. Alhamdulillah, you guys have a good community, a good sized community here. And I think most of the groups that I end up speaking to have <coughs> communities that they can rely on. We did not. Um, and so my mom had to find a masjid that we could connect to and I was lucky to find the picture of this masjid. As you can see, it's very humble. It's in like a townhouse somewhere in the Bronx. It's run by a lot of Guyanese and Pakistani Muslims. And I have nothing but fond memories of my years there. But it was only about three or four years that we were going to the masjid. We would go on Saturdays. We would learn the basics, you know, basic um, uh, surah recitation and memorization, um, how to pray, um, different uh, hadiths, and just the very basics that you would teach your children when they're in like elementary school. But unfortunately, due to a lot of things that were going on at home, my mom wasn't able to consistently keep us going to the masjid. And so I would say by the time I hit maybe fifth grade, we weren't going anymore. And that unfortunately contributed as well to my um, identity and faith crisis later on. And at the same time, there was still a lot of arguing going on at home. There were a lot of issues happening. And when you're young and you see your parents arguing all the time, it really not only breaks your heart, but it causes a lot of psychological trauma. And even though I knew, again, that my parents loved us very much, just because you love your kids, it's not enough. You have to show it. There has to be a healthy way that you exhibit that behavior. And unfortunately, that wasn't always the case in our household. And so my two younger sisters and I developed our own sort of ways of coping with what was going on at home. I would say, and I think my sisters would agree, that I was the most affected by it for two reasons. Number one, I was the eldest, or I am the eldest. And the second reason is um, I'm the most sensitive. And watching my mother cry many nights, watching my parents not really in a happy marriage, um, really affected me very, very deeply. And so we all three had our different ways of coping, but um, for the most part, I think I was the one who was most uh, psychologically affected by that that trauma. So in my, by the time I got to high school, these are some images of me in high school. I wasn't praying. My mom was praying here and there, but because of a lot of the issues that were going on at home, my mom unfortunately had to go work um, so that we could have food on the table. And there wasn't anybody teaching us Islam. There wasn't anybody watching over us to basically guide us. Again, we didn't have a community around us. My mother's side all lived in Syria. My father's side, even though they were geographically close to us, they're very secular. Um, they didn't practice. And so as irreligious as my immediate family was, we were considered the most religious um, in comparison to my cousins who definitely were not practicing. So it was very easy for me by the time I got to high school to just make friends with a lot of, you know, people who had different values and different faith backgrounds. And I don't want to say that that's necessarily a bad thing um, because good people come from all walks of life, 
but when you're in your teenage years and you're going through a lot of psychological change and physical change, it can be very dangerous not to know what your moral compass is. And that was something that definitely affected me. By the time I was a senior in high school, I had already started questioning the existence of God. I didn't have the um, academic understanding yet, but internally I was suffering, I was struggling. And I was doing things like not fasting during Ramadan, even though I grew up fasting. Like I said, I didn't pray. I was hanging out with the wrong people. Um, and just generally questioning, you know, what, what is this all for? Why are we alive? What is the point of life? And so there was a moment when I was 18 years old, I'll never forget it. It was after I got accepted to college and I was going away to a college two hours away from my home. So I was dorming, um, which is already very taboo, <laughs> right? Um, I stopped and I said, I need to pray today. I felt very, very depressed one day. And I remember it was between Maghrib and Aisha, and I couldn't wait for Aisha to come in. And Maghrib was about to go out. And I stopped, I made wudu, and I went into my mother's bedroom, and I started praying. And I remember being so angry. I was crying tears of rage. How many of you have ever cried tears of rage? <laughs> yeah, those hot tears that drip down your face, that's, that was me in this moment. And I was crying tears of rage for two reasons. One, I was so angry with God. How could he allow an innocent girl to go through what I went through? What did I do to be asked to be born? Did I ask to be born into this family? Did I ask for these traumatizing things to happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? What kind of God, astaghfirullah, would allow that? And the second reason I was so upset is because I didn't feel connected during the salah. I didn't feel anything. And I always thought, you have to feel something when you're praying. You at least have to feel that God is listening or that he exists. And I didn't feel that. And so I didn't even finish the prayer. I didn't do the salam at the end. I just got up, took off the hijab and threw it and didn't put on a hijab for another 10 years after that. And then I went to college, two hours away from my family. And the college was um, in Connecticut. There wasn't an MSA, like now there are MSAs everywhere. There was no such thing at this school. Now they have it, but they didn't back then. This was in 2004. And this quote from um, Umar ibn al-Khattab really captures what I was going through at this moment. It says, he who does not live in the way of his beliefs starts to believe in the way he lives. And so I had no beliefs, I had no guidance, so whoever was around me, whatever they were doing, that became my belief system. I was very vulnerable and very suscept uh, easily susceptible to their way of life. My freshman year of college, I came back to this question, does God exist? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why did bad things have to happen to me? And I started taking a lot of courses in philosophy, post-colonial literature, critical race theory, gender studies, religion, and finally I thought there's an answer in these books, in these dead scholars who wrote about these things. There's answers here. And the answer kept coming back to, there is no God. There, there is no meaning to life. All of this is accidental. That was the message I kept getting in, in all of the courses that I was taking in college. And you have to remember, at the same time that I'm learning this in college, there's nothing on the other side to teach me about Islam. I had nothing to argue back with. And so I started down the road of what's known as existentialism. It's a type of philosophy. And existentialism basically says, man is nothing but what he makes of himself. And that is the point. That life is meaningless. You're born, you live, you suffer, you die. And life only has meaning because you give it meaning. And then, I read a lot of Nietzsche. How many of you know of Nietzsche? Frederick Nietzsche, yeah. I remember it was 2005. I was studying for my midterm exams. I was on the second floor of my university library. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And I'm in one of the cubicles and I'm reading Nietzsche, writing a paper for one of my courses. And subhanAllah, that 
night I had a visceral reaction, a physical reaction. And it was the first time, even though I was going through my doubts, it was the first time that I said out loud to myself, God doesn't exist. That was the moment at which I realized I had left Islam. And to describe the phase and the uh, sort of process that I went through, I want to show you this uh, slide about the seven stages of grief. When I was in high school, I went through that initial shock of, wait, is it even possible that God doesn't exist? Is that a possibility? And then you go through denial, astaghfirullah, no way, like that's blasphemy. It goes against everything you've ever been taught. And then you're angry because you realize, wait a minute, have I been lied to? Have my parents been lying to me? Has history been lying to me? Has the world been lying to me about God's existence? And then you start bargaining, you look for a way out. Well, maybe God does exist, but maybe Islam is not the right religion. Maybe organized religion is not the right religion. Maybe I'm agnostic. I believe in a higher power, but you know, my relationship with God is between me and him. And then you go through depression, because now you're totally confused. You don't know what to believe anymore. You don't want to believe that your parents have been lying to you or that you've been duped by society. And at the same time, and this was certainly the case for me, but what about all of the, the sins that I have committed? If I believe God exists, I will be held accountable for these sins. But if I believe he doesn't exist, I'm off the hook. So then comes testing and acceptance, a relief. So if I don't believe God exists, I get a free pass. I can start over. I don't have to feel bad about my life. I don't have to feel bad about myself. Do you see where I'm going with this? And then finally I decided, okay, I'm a humanist. I believe that religion is a hoax. I believe that good people can be good people and you don't need God or religion to guide you. Simple principles, do unto others as you wish to have done unto you. You know, the golden rules. And rely on science and reason. That's all you need. You don't need anything else other than that. This meme is funny to me because how many of you are in college? Okay, you, you ladies tell me if this is true. For you or people you know who are in college. You study something in your classes, you come back home, you try to tell your parents about it, and you feel like now you're a know-it-all, and like you know something that they don't know. Do you know what I'm talking about? That was me. Every holiday, every summer, would come back and like very arrogantly try to school my parents on the modern world, on progressivism. Like, you guys need to catch up. You're so old school. You come from Palestine and Syria where people believe in superstitious things like black magic and God. And it's all myth. It's like Greek mythology. What, do you, what is wrong with you? Catch up. That was my attitude. And this is the attitude of a lot of college students today. And it's understandable why. Because we are taught to think and behave this way in college. Right? We're empowered by these books that they give us. They gave us science and reason, hard facts. And then you come home and you try to tell your mother who's wearing hijab or your father who has an accent and doesn't speak English very well and drives a taxi cab. You try to teach them, you know, catch them up, these poor immigrants. So after college, during my 20s, I spent 10 years lost, wandering, trying to find myself. I was hanging out with the wrong people. I was doing whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted to do it. If you can imagine, once you decide God doesn't exist, you don't have guidance, right? So what, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? What tells you what's right and what's wrong? Nothing. Your friends, how they live their life. You're no longer accountable to a higher power. So you're doing whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. And so, like I said, I was hanging out with a lot of the wrong people. And when I say wrong people, I mean people with good hearts, but with a very different lifestyle and very different values from me and the values that my parents wanted for me. And I didn't hide the fact from my parents that I didn't believe in God, and you can't even begin to imagine how they reacted to that. Um, my mother, bless her, tried very hard to, you know, over the 10 years, get me to change my mind. She made a lot of da'at for me, and I still believe to this day, if it wasn't for her prayers for me, I would have never 
My father kind of just felt like I was a lost cause. My sisters felt I was a lost cause. Alhamdulillah, they did not go through the same experience that I went through. But I was trying to grapple with a lot of the trauma that I went through as a kid, and I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand why these bad things had to happen. And I felt, well, if these things had to happen, then there's no way there's a God. A God would not let this happen to a little girl. And so I learned the language of secular liberalism. How many of you have heard this phrase before? Secular liberalism? Yeah. It basically is the idea that um, religion is not the truth. And it's the society that we live in, the separation of religion and state, right? We'd say church and state. Um, where you can practice your religion in the privacy of your home, but it has nothing to do with the public sphere. Um, and instead of having Islam be my guidance, I adopted their theories, like critical race theory, feminism, um, liberalism, uh, a lot of their Western philosophical uh, schools of thought. And so when you do that, when you replace the deen with these academic things that you learn in college, you basically have changed not only your values, but how you go about solving injustice in society. So for example, methanan. When it comes to women's rights, Islam tells us what women's rights are, and it tells us how to go about attaining those rights through the Sharia, right? Secular liberalism doesn't have the Sharia or the Quran or the Hadith to tell us that. It has something called feminism that tells us how women should get their rights. Now, I'm not going to get into detail about how and why Islam and feminism are not compatible. And the problem with a lot of young sisters today is that they're going to college, like I did, studying feminism, walking away thinking that feminism and Islam are compatible, and then later on realizing that they have to choose between the two. And many, many times, they're choosing feminism over Islam because they don't understand Islam and they aren't able to recognize the discrepancy between these two philosophies. And that's just one example of many. Atheism is another one, okay? So I was a very big social justice uh, activist in college. I was you know, protesting all the time, organizing protests. After college, I went into the poorest neighborhoods in the Bronx and in Harlem and you know, taught a lot of poor children. I got my master's at the same time. I was very, very involved in social justice. I believe that there, and I still believe, you know, that there's a lot of ills in society and they need to be corrected and I wanted to be an agent for change. My problem was the way that I was going about it was not within Islamic framework. It was within a, a secular framework. And so when you do that, when you give up Islam for something else, you are going to adopt the full package. That means you have to take not just one of their beliefs, one of secular liberalism's belief, you're gonna take the whole thing. You're buying a package. And so that package meant that I had to believe in feminism, gay rights, same-sex marriage, um, you know, that basically there's no ultimate truth, like there can only be one truth. No, you have your truth, I have my truth, she has her truth. Everybody has a truth and it's all valid, right? Everybody's truth is valid. Everybody should feel valued. And you should never say anything that's gonna offend somebody else's truth. I want you to remember that because that point, that premise, which I had to adopt when I became an atheist, that is where I began to crumb, my atheism began to crumble because I realized later on, that doesn't make any sense. How can there not be an absolute truth? If everybody has their own truth, how can we make sense of anything, right? Don't these truths contradict each other? What if you believe one thing, I believe another, but you're saying both of them are valid? How can that be? Um, and then another thing <laughs> that happened during my 20s that uh, brought me, alhamdulillah, back to Islam is I got married when I was 25. The marriage didn't last more than two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. And that's because the very foundation of that relationship was broken to begin with. Neither he nor I um, were practicing Muslims. We had diseases of the heart of our own. And so when you have something like that, what do you expect? What do you expect? He's not a God-fearing man, I'm not a God-fearing woman. There was way too much going on um, in that relationship and it didn't last. And the red flags were there from the very beginning, but I was too blind to see them. But that failed marriage was the catalyst, the final straw 
or as we say, the straw that broke the camel's back, that led me to realize I'm so tired of the life that I'm leading. None of this is making sense to me. I'm miserable, I'm depressed, I have anxiety, nothing is going my way. Um, the world doesn't make sense. And even around the friends that I was hanging out with, after several years, you start to realize, what is this for? What is the meaning? They, have, they live day to day, they don't think about the future. What is, the, yani, what is the purpose of this life that we're living? And so at the age of 27, 28, I was back to this process of what is the meaning of life? And this time, instead of saying God doesn't exist, I started to ask myself again, does God exist? Because the opposite has not been working for me. Atheism has not been helping me. It's gotten me nowhere, except maybe digging my grave. So what, what alternative do I have? But now I'm 10 years older, I'm a lot better um, educated, and I decided this time I'm gonna read the Quran from cover to cover on my own. And I'm gonna go to um, Shiyukh, and I'm gonna understand the tafsir of these different surahs and ayahs. Because no one taught me that growing up. It was just memorize it, memorize it so you can pray, memorize it so you can, I don't know what I was saying. Even though I'm Arab, I didn't understand Fusha. I didn't know what I was saying. But this time I had the English translation on one side, and I know it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. I had the English translation on one side, the Arabic on the other, and I spent about a month reading it carefully, writing down questions and asking questions about it. I can't tell you how many times I cried <laughs> and how many times um, it brought me to my knees to pray. And I thought to myself, how come no one told me about this surah? How come no one told me about this ayah? If only they had taught me to love Allah before fearing Allah. You know, and so alhamdulillah, being able to do that as a 28 year old, when you're a lot more, your brain is more developed, it was a different experience for me. This time I was proud. I was so proud of that book. I mean, it gives me goosebumps even to, to say it now. Um, I did give these other religions a chance because I said, you know what, if I have to start all over, I'm gonna do it right. And so I focused on the Abrahamic faiths. I read um, some parts of the uh, Torah in English, and then I read um, the Bible. And I thought to myself, there's way too many contradictions here, way too many things that people could not answer for me, um, and it just didn't make sense. And then reading the Quran, which not only made sense to me, but also addressed a lot of the issues in the Torah and the Bible, I realized, okay, this, this is the only logical conclusion here. And so that's why, eventually, this is the book that spoke to me. This is the book that um, brought me back to believing again. And I want to emphasize this point. My question was, does God exist? I didn't say, is Islam the truth? I came at this from the point of, well, if I don't believe anything, let me just start over then, right? And inshallah, none of you will have to go through that. But I wanted to mention that because I wanted you to understand that coming back to the Quran was not just um, a feeling of desperation. I really tried to use my reason and my mind and to put my feelings to the side and really give this a shot because if I was coming back, I was never gonna go back again to atheism. This was the first uh, ayah that made me cry. Um, what surah is that from? Surah Al-Alaq, yes. Um, and it's about the, the creation of uh, the human being. And I know it's cliche, but 1400 years ago, this is what's being talked about in the Quran, you know, about the clot that develops in the mother's womb. It's just so poignant. You can't find anything like that in any other scripture. And there were a lot of du'as that I recited that brought me back to Islam as well. In 2015, when I had taken the shahada again, um, Ramadan was coming up just like it is now. And remember, I had not been fasting at that point for almost 10 years. And I decided I'm gonna fast this year. I want to fast. And I was excited to prepare for it. I was very nervous because I was gonna go into a masjid again for the first time and I felt like I didn't deserve to. I felt like, um, uh, I just felt like a, like I just didn't deserve it. How could I go back into the house of Allah after everything I have done, after doubting his existence? I felt very ashamed. Um, and I remember reciting these du'as after every salah, um, asking Allah 
never to allow me to stray away from him ever again. It was the worst 10 years of my life, psychologically, mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally. Um, so much was lost, so much time was, was lost. And I want to read to you a, um, if I can find it here, I would like to just quickly read to you an excerpt from a diary entry that I wrote. At the age of 28, I reverted to Islam. So much time was lost, so much to make up for. Getting going wasn't easy, it still isn't easy, and each day is a reminder of how incredibly important the passing minutes of my life are. When I finally came to and stood for Salah for the first time in a decade, I realized I had completely forgotten the ritual of Salah. I had to relearn like a child learning to read or walk for the first time. I had only memorized the shortest surahs, Al-Fatiha, Al-Nas, Al-Ikhlas, Al-Falaq, Al-Fil. I was ashamed, critical of the previous decade that I had allowed to pass by <coughs> ephemerally. My first Ramadan as a revert was in 2015. I read the Quran in its entirety for the first time, and I actually comprehended its meaning and context. I memorized surah, surahs Al-Qadr, Al-Qari'a, Al-Takathur, Al-Zalzala, Al-Sharh, Al-Duha, Al-Teen, al humaza and Al-Adiyat in order to increase khushu during Salah. That was one month before Ramadan started. I prayed Tarawih at the 96th Street Masjid, which is in Manhattan, each night, and I fasted for the first time on my own accord. Two thousand, since 2015, my life has changed drastically. Alhamdulillah for the peace Islam has brought me, if only it had happened sooner. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you because that's where I was mentally at that time. And by far it was the best year of my life. Um, the people that I had been hanging out with, I didn't cut them off like I said to them, oh, I can't be your friend anymore, or we're not going to hang out. They just kind of fizzed away because my time was being spent in the masjid, my time was being spent seeking out teachers, and I was busy. I was busy trying to learn Islam um, for myself. And um, there was just a tremendous peace. I can't even describe to you the peace that I felt. And I want you to know that I wasn't just reading the Quran. I had a lot of questions. A lot of the same questions that young sisters and brothers have, like, why does this surah say this? Why does this ayah say this? Why was slavery permitted? Why was Aisha so young? You know, a lot of these controversial questions that people ask. And so what I did during the month of Ramadan is I had a notebook and I would fast during the day. I would come home, take a little nap, and then I would wake up, pray Asr, and I would start my studies. And my studies include memorizing um, surahs as I went along, writing them out in Arabic, and then writing the English translation so that I understood when I stood to pray what I was saying, okay? When I recite a surah, if I don't know what I'm saying, I'm not gonna choose that surah because that's when salah for me becomes just a movement. It's just, you know, an act. And when that becomes a habit, that's when I start to feel more distant from my deen. So I have to understand what I'm saying. Um, so for those of you for whom Arabic is not your mother tongue, Arabic is supposed to be my mother tongue. I don't know Arabic like that. I'm still learning it, so don't let that be an excuse for you, okay? Um, and then after I would do that, I would start writing out different uh, du'as, like the ones you see on the screen here, and I would try to memorize those as well. In the beginning, it was hard because I would have to have my phone out after salah, and this is allowed, by the way. You can have your phone you know, there after your prayer. And you can recite the surah, uh, the, the du'a in English, in Arabic, in Urdu, whatever language, you know, is your uh, mother tongue. But understand what you're saying so you can feel it. Um, and then after that, I would watch a couple of videos online that I had already bookmarked. And I spent a lot of time watching videos by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, <coughs> Imam Zaid Shakir, um, Siraj Wahaj. And a lot of these um, Sunni scholars who touch upon these issues, Omar Suleiman, Sheikh al-Shanawi, um, who I'm not just saying it, he was really one of the most influential uh, shuyukh to me, um, watching him and his videos because of his approach and because he was <coughs> discussing matters that were relevant to my generation at the time. So you guys are so blessed and lucky to have him as your shaykh, um, mashallah.
And then after I would do that, we would break our fast, my mom, my dad, and myself, and then we would go to the masjid and pray that we didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave the masjid <laughs> to go back home and then go to work the next day. It was so peaceful to just be there and um, to be with a congregation of people, that feeling you get, you know what I'm talking about when you're praying that we and all the Muslims are together and we're praying together. If only Ramadan was all year long, right? Um, so make the most of it. Um, the other thing that I was doing, and again, this started during Ramadan, but it continued after that, is I had to change my mindset. I grew up being very um, strong-minded, very feminist-minded, watching my mom, you know, take charge of the household, I basically learned unconsciously that you have to be strong. You have to be outspoken, you have to be um, confrontational. And it's not that those are bad things necessarily, but there's a way and a time and a place for it. And up until this point, I had adopted so much poisonous thinking, I needed to humble myself again. So for example, when my mom, um, when I would say to my mom, you know, tell me if I'm doing something wrong, tell me if I'm out of line, just asking her to check me was a sign of humility. I'm 28 at that point, okay? So for those of you who feel like, well, I'm 16, 17, 18, I don't need my mom telling me what to do, I was 28 asking my mom to tell me what to do because I had to relearn. I had to relearn a lot of things. And I would look to my sisters and the new Muslims that I was um, beginning to meet and ask them for their advice. I was doing less talking in those three years that followed and more listening. And for me, someone who's very chatty, I'm out that I'm gonna listen. I don't have to agree with everything, but if I listen, I might learn something. The other thing that I had to do was unlearn a lot of the things that I learned in college and in, during my 20s. So in this image, for example, the scale is supposed to represent justice. And I gave a talk not too long ago. It's online, by the way, you can find it on YouTube. It was about feminism and identity politics. And I was trying to explain to brothers and sisters that the way that formal education is set up, it is set up and designed to get you to ultimately doubt religion anyway, okay? Um, and I won't go into specifically how, you can watch that video on YouTube for yourself. But the problem is, when we're talking about justice and fairness and doing the right thing, we're using the wrong framework. Instead of looking to Islam, we're looking to all of these other things in society today to help us get that justice. And that's the wrong approach. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong uh, paradigm. So when you're in college um, and you're going through, actually even before college, now it starts in preschool, a little bit of background. By trade, I'm an English teacher. I taught middle and high school. I was also an assistant principal, and I have a Montessori background. Um, I was an assistant principal at a preschool. And so I'm very involved in the field of education, both public and private. And the trajectory, the direction that curriculum is going towards is more and more affirming of things that um, Christians, Jews, and Muslims do not believe. Practicing Christians, Jews, and Muslims do not believe. So for instance, a lot of... Uh, LGBTQ affirming uh, material is now available at the preschool level. Um, and so even though this may not have been the case for us growing up, it's available now, but for us growing up, what was normal? What were some of the things that were normal, that we were taught were normal, that Islam tells us is not okay? Yes. Dating. Dating. Simple. Right? What else? Music. Sure. What else? What else have you been growing up thinking is like, oh, you know, this is, what's the big deal? Like, everything's haram in Islam. Try everything once. Huh? Try everything. Try everything. YOLO. You only live <laughs> once, right? There's no akhira. Right? So every generation has its new challenges. On top of the stuff that has already been taught, every generation has a new challenge. The current generation, Generation Z, is dealing with this gender uh, identity question. Um... I'm gonna quickly go through the next slides, but basically for the young sisters in the room, especially those of you who are college bound, I want to caution you when you're taking your courses, be very, very wise about what you're studying and how you're being taught what you're studying. You are gonna be studying a lot of uh, material and people whose ideas have been basically given a stamp of approval and we, you're gonna be taught that this is the truth. Okay, be smart, question it. Why is this the truth? 
where does the, this history come from? If liberalism is the truth, what is the, the history? Everything has a history. Find out where it started. Here, this was the beginning of the downfall of the Catholic Church. Right? So you might study about Martin Luther. This was a man you know, from Germany who basically questioned the Catholic Church and their practices. He was the beginning, the catalyst, of what ultimately led people to doubt the Catholic Church. Okay, And even though that doesn't have to do with us specifically, this is the beginning of a lot of enlightenment and secular ideas, which do affect us today. Um, the other thing that helped me a lot during Ramadan and afterwards is I was reading a lot of uh, supplementary texts. Like this is one of my favorite books. It's called The Diseases of the Heart and Their Cure by um, Ibn Taymiyyah. I highly recommend it. You can get it for a couple of bucks online um, on Amazon. And it's mind blowing. I mean, for me it's mind blowing because I read it for the first time when I was 29. Um, but for Shuch, it's, you know, it's a staple, it's a standard. And here are just a couple of quotes from Ibn Taymiyyah. It's better to have the right tawheed and numerous sins than to have few sins and be upon a corrupt tawheed. And I mean, that just hits my heart every time I, I read it because believing in God and acknowledging that you are not sinless and repenting or thinking that there is no God and you're not sinning, defending your sins, making your sins okay. That's when we have a problem. And the biggest blessing you can ever have is the feeling of guilt. When you feel guilty, say alhamdulillah. Say alhamdulillah, because when that guilt starts to disappear, you're in trouble. And my guilt disappeared for 10 years. That's why I was in serious trouble. Guilt is a good thing. It means you have a conscience. You have a moral you know, consciousness there that's trying to keep you on the right path. And the second quote that guidance is not attained except with knowledge and correct direction is not attained except with patience. Do not give up on yourself. There are gonna be many questions that will be left unanswered. That doesn't mean you should doubt your entire foundation, okay? Even though your professors and a lot of the people around you will make you feel that way, it's, it's not true. So give yourself time and patience. Um, it's, it's a process and we're fighting a very big battle here. So just to summarize and then open it up to you guys, the big takeaways here is to properly educate yourself. Don't fall into the trap that I fell into, which is coming from a very weak Islamic background, going to college and studying Western disciplines and then using the, those disciplines to try to critique the Quran. It doesn't work. You cannot take philosophy, put it on top of the Quran and judge the Quran that way. They're two different paradigms. And that's something that most Muslims do not, you know, come to realize. The other big takeaway is to choose your social circle wisely, um, especially when you're young. You are way more susceptible to adopting your friends' uh, ways and values than to hang on to what your parents taught you and what your congregation in the masjid has taught you. So make sure you're choosing your friends wisely. There is nothing wrong, and I say this all the time, there is nothing wrong with saying a polite farewell to people who have been in your life so you can make room for new people in your life. People come and go. They will come and go. And remember, on the day of judgment, even your mother is not going to be there for you. So don't give your friends so much importance. I still love and value every person that has ever come into my life. They were there for a certain period of time, for a certain reason. Inshallah, I did well by them and then you move on. And then the other takeaway is to develop a healthy relationship with your parents and your children. And I'll, I'll say two things here. For the uh, youngsters in the room, please remember that your parents are not perfect, okay? Go easy on them. Especially like my parents, they're immigrant parents, you know, they, they have a lot of ways from back home that maybe doesn't fit or make sense for us here, but they also have a lot of beautiful things that they're teaching us that we don't wanna lose. You don't wanna lose your heritage. You don't wanna lose your culture completely, right? It's a part of your identity and it's a beautiful part of your identity. So have patience with your parents. Also keep in the back of your mind that our society sets up the conversation to make immigrants and people who come from abroad 
to make them look like they're uneducated, like they don't know any better, like they have nothing to offer. This is so wrong, you know? And I'm saying this as somebody who used to see my parents this way. It's not true. It took me years to realize, oh my God, that thing that mama used to tell me, she was right. Even though she had an accent when she was saying it, and I, you know, thought she was silly for saying it, but Siani, the truth is, she was right. She was right about this, and Baba too, you know? For the parents, two things. One, you have to understand your daughters and your sons are battling things you did not have to battle. So please have patience with them, please. They're in a different time, in a different place, and the challenges they have, they don't have the kinds of community you had back home. They didn't have the kinds of challenges that you were facing. I mean, imagine, they're dealing with atheism, they're dealing with the LGBTQ movement, they're dealing with um, the attack on Muslims. Like, there's a lot going on, uh, just, you know, for them to have to deal with. It's not easy, and they're young, too. And they're trying to just be normal human beings at the same time, it's very difficult. The second thing is, and this is something I learned through my upbringing and also watching um, lots of other children and also being a teacher, make sure that the punishment fits the crime. Do not overreact. Do not overreact. When you start overreacting, I'm gonna tell you what your kids are gonna start doing if they haven't already started doing it. They're gonna lie to you. <coughs> They're gonna start lying to you. And then that lying is gonna become habitual. It's gonna become chronic. And when it becomes chronic, they become chronic liars and that's who they are for life. They don't know how not to lie. And the reason they lie is because they're trying to avoid your reaction. Not because they fear Allah, which inshallah they do. Not because they fear that you're gonna punish them or ground them or take away their cell phone. But because your verbal or physical reaction causes anxiety to them, they're gonna lie to you. You don't want them to lie to you, obviously. You want to keep the lines of communication open, let the punishment fit the crime, and given the times that we're in, be prepared for anything. You have to be prepared for anything. This is the test of our time. Know you're not the only mother who's going through what you're going through with your kids. I promise you, you're not the only one. As a teacher, <laughs> you know, as someone who has uh, three nephews and a niece and who is expecting my own child, like, you're not the only one. We're all going through the same thing. We're all going through the battle together. Do not be ashamed, do not be scared. Allah is with us, okay? But do not be surprised by what your, your kids have to tell you. You would much rather them come to you to have an open dialogue with you and tell you what's going on than for them to go to a teacher, a counselor, a friend, a mentor, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a'udhu billah, and to seek help there. Because that's what's happening when they don't feel like they can come to their parents. So keep the lines of communication open. And wallahi, if my mother didn't do that, I would never have come back to Islam. You think she wasn't disappointed in me? You think she wasn't afraid for my akhirah? Of course she was. But she never, ever, ever shut the door on me. She always kept it open. So lastly, what I wanted to share with you guys is a list of resources because I'm always asked, well, okay, how can I implement some of these things that you're saying? I put together a list of resources. The first section is on if you're having doubts in faith or if you're struggling with some of the things that I struggled with, there's a list of books, videos, articles there, and I break it down into topics like feminism, LGBTQ, transgenderism, secular theory. Then there's a section on homeschooling for parents who are interested in that or who are doing that. There's resources there. And then there's a section on parenthood and within that, there's a section on the importance of fathers. So share that with your husbands, okay? Or the young girls, share it with your dads um, as well. Fathers need to be involved. They have a very active role, and we have to support them in stepping up to be better fathers as well. That's the QR code, and then that's the URL if you want it. I believe the sheikh said that he would make some copies as well, physical copies, but actually the electronic version is better because you can click on the links that way. Um, I did bring a couple of books here for the parents if they wanted to take a look. This is a book that I highly recommend, highly, highly recommend. It's called Hold On To Your Kids. Um, and it, it really focuses on the science behind why teenagers and children today are not respecting the authority of their parents and why they're turning to their peers for guidance instead. 
and how that happened and what we can do to fix that, okay? And then, I don't know if this applies to anybody here, but I have had this question before, so I brought these books as well. They have to do with homosexuality. Um, for anyone who <coughs> is just interested for whatever reason, there's no questions that need to be asked. And again, there's also a list here on this resource page. This, these are two books by the leading scholar on homosexuality. His name is Joseph Nicolosi. He um, is now dead, but his son continues his work. Um, there's a special type of therapy that is conducted for uh, mostly males who are struggling with same-sex attraction and who are trying to fix that. Um, and basically, the premise here is that same-sex attraction develops due to childhood trauma. Um, but that's all I'll say about that. So these are just a couple of things here. You're free and welcome to come up and um, take a look at them after the Q&A. And that's it. Jazakallahu khairan. And thank you again for listening. Thank you.